Hello, everybody. We are going to start our Facebook Live in just a few minutes. Uh, please, you can join us and you can ask questions by using the box uh, on the comments below. We're just going to wait a few more minutes to start at one o'clock. Thank you. Thank you all for who are joining us now. We're going to get started in just a few more minutes. Welcome, Elaine. We're going to certainly address your question, how we are all doing these very scary times. And you can join us by asking more questions and we can have our panelists responding to them. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. You're going to get started in another minute. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us here today. The Canadian Premature Babies Foundation is really committed to continue to educate and support NICU families uh, in regular times and especially during these very challenging times that we are living. Uh, my name is Fabiana Bacchini, I'm the Executive Director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation. And every Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, which is Toronto time, we will bring you an expert to address all your questions and concerns during this time. And every Wednesday at 1 p.m., Kate Robinson, who is a psychotherapist and also a mom of two premature girls, she's hosting a parent uh, group in real time and all the links for those sessions will be in our social media channels. So please join us. And if you have any um, ideas of topics I would like us to be addressing or questions, please always send on our social media channels and we're going to try our best to bring the experts uh, to answer all them for you. And today we have a wonderful panel and I will start by introduce you Kasia uh, Pilek. I'm sure I mispronounced her last name. Uh, she is a clinical social worker, worker in, uh, working then I see at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. She has worked with many parents both during their child and ICU stay and afterwards through Sinai's peer-to-peer -peer, uh, support programs and then ICU's family advisory committee. She has presented at numerous uh, um, conferences and workshops on self-care and family integrated care and the impact of a baby's admissions on parents' mental health. Welcome, Kasia, and thank you for joining us here today. I know you are very busy in the unit. And on behalf of all the nice you parents, I want to thank you for all that you do for families, especially during these very uh, challenging times. 
And I'm sure um, all the parents and us at the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation are extremely grateful for the frontline workers who are working hours and hours, days and days to support families and patients during this uh, pandemic. So thank you. Thanks, Fabiana. I will also introduce you to Carolyn, um, Carolyn Layton Hilburn. She is from Waterloo, Ontario. She's a mother of three boys who were born prematurely. During her second experience in the NICU with her twin boys, she experienced not only the typical routine of an NICU, which is already challenging, but the additional stress of three months in contact isolation at the hospital. Carolyn, her husband, learned to manage isolation with some bumps and tears, according to her, but she figured out a routine to care for her babies and older child at home and themselves during an uncertain time. And on the bottom corner is Pam. Pam is from Calgary, Alberta. Thank you for joining us, Pam. Uh, she's a mother of two children. Her second child was born 10 weeks early. She spent 112 days in the NICU due to many neuromuscular conditions that made it difficult for him to move, breathe, and eat. When they were discharged at home, the loneliness and isolation of caring for a magically complex child really set it. Life was different and uncertain, according to Pam. She now volunteers as a peer mentor at the Alberta Children's Hospital in Calgary to support families through their NICU journey. She feels it's an important role in letting families feel seen and heard and helping them recognize they are never alone. She's also CPBF's family ambassador in Alberta. Thank you, Pam, for joining us from Alberta. I hope the weather there is beautiful as it is in Toronto today. We can only see through the window, the sun is shining. Uh, but I know Kasha has a very limited time today. So I wanna start by asking her a few questions about how parents are actually doing inside the NICU and share with us some strategies uh, on how can we all cope during this time of isolation. So Kasia, with the hospital policies changing so rapidly because this is also so new to everyone, overall, how are the current parents in the NICU coping with those changes? You know, I... I... It, it the NICU is stressful at the best of times and now and now we have COVID-19 adding an additional layer of stress so um everyone is coping as best as they can and and given how quickly things are changing um the visiting policy um has changed very very quickly at at this point right now at, at Sinai we're only allowing one parent in for a 24-hour period um, which can be really distressing to parents especially for parents mums that are breastfeeding uh, which means the dad can't come in um, could be for weeks before they see their baby again. So for the most part I think people are understanding why we've had to put these these uh, policies and restri restrictions in place. Um, in terms of how are we coping and how are we, we um, helping these parents cope with the additional stress now of COVID-19, we do have something called e-rounds in the unit. Um, and so we are using for e-rounds, we're um, increasing the amount of parents that we have on e-rounds so they can at least participate on medical rounds in the morning. Um, we have enough iPads now that we're able to um, increase that capacity um, and also have um, families look at their baby, visit with their baby for a little bit um, while we're waiting for the team to get to their bed space. We're also using the iPads now uh, for just regular e-visits. So after e-rounds are done, they can um, log in and again, talk to baby, sing to baby, read to baby. So at least they're getting some interaction with it with with their baby. Um, it's not ideal, uh, but for the most part, people are understanding that we're all in this together and we're putting these policies and restrictions in place for safety reasons. Um, and, and I think sometimes there are some knee jer jerk reactions, which is understandable. Um, but once we, we kind of explain why things are happening the way that they are, um, families do um, get to a place of understanding. That is um, yeah. 
So yeah. it's amazing how technology has been uh, helping families at this time. And there are also two hospitals in Canada, Saskatchewan and the Royal Alexander Hospitals, that they have the NICU view, which is a camera that is located immediately on, uh, on top of the baby's uh, incubator. So the parents can actually see the babies uh, constantly. I think the technology really is playing a, a big role uh, in this time of distancing, certainly for us at home, but I can imagine how it's helping parents at the hospitals. But also, Kasha, uh, cell phones, are cell phones being allowed in the unit, like in your unit now, so parents can maybe FaceTime or have a conversation with extended family members or siblings and other kids at home who unfortunately cannot come to see their, their baby brother or sister at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. So that was a, a policy back back before all this happened. We, we did have a policy where cell phones weren't allowed, um, but that restriction so parents can now use FaceTime to to FaceTime partners relatives siblings in we do have I don't we have these bags sorry we have to wear masks now but I'm in my office so I don't have to wear my mask but I brought the biohazard bag um, I don't know if you can see this so that they can put their um, phones in here um, it's a it, it, this isn't the exact bag but it's something similar so that they can use it it works with their phone so that they're still able to use their phone their their phone um is protected uh from the germs that way so then it's great because we cannot play music for the babies or you can read ebooks to babies with the cell phone so it can continue to stimulate uh you know create stimulus for the baby and then i see because we know music is so important and and reading a mom's voice so you can have the use of this technology as well absolutely and uh, and also taking videos and photos that's still an important part of their experience and we still want them to have that so the other way that for parents that can't come in based on distance um or what for a variety of reasons, because Ronald McDonald House now um, is no longer accepting families. So there are families that live quite far away who can't come to the unit every day. So we are also using the iPad to take videos and photos for their babies to send to them directly. Yeah, it's definitely very challenging times. And uh, I'm hoping that this can have an end of soon so parents can actually go back to the unit and cuddle their babies and stay there and have visitors, uh, extended family and siblings. But Kasha, we also know across the country, all the peer support groups and the classes have been suspended. So we avoid contact with other families. But can you uh, suggest or give us some strategies on how families can cope or how can they make the best of that time in the ICU at the moment adding this layer of stress how can you give some strategies to them to cope with this time sure so in terms of the groups um we are um trialing e-classes for next week so we're gonna try to see how this goes we've already had a few people signed up for it so we are going to do some virtual classes i also know that some of the community groups have moved online as well um, so that we're encouraging families to connect that way. But it, but just in general, in terms of how do you cope with, with just a very stressful time, um, I would say sticking with your routine and getting into your routine is, is key. Um, so even if you are at home, it's getting up, taking a shower, putting on clothes that, I mean, you don't have to be dressed to the nines, but at least out of your pajamas and um, into clothes that, that make you feel like you're ready to tackle the day that that kind of brings some um uh it kind of breaks up the day and breaks up the monotony of the day to say okay my day is starting now i've taken my shower i've done all my my oral hygiene and and i'm in my clothes and i'm ready to to do whatever the day brings um so i would say that's key I would also say reaching out to people. So even though we have to social distance, again, using that technology, it, it, the, one of the great things about the era, the age that we're in is, is using FaceTime, using some of the apps that are out there um, that allow you to interact with people and see them and see their expressions. It's not ideal, but it's still sometimes even better than a telephone. Uh, but if you don't like the if you don't like the FaceTime, telephone is just as good. But reaching out to people, not 
completely isolating yourselves. We are social beings and, and we need that interaction. Um, so maybe starting small and, and, and calling people. Well, I know a lot of people sometimes also don't like the phone or like, like FaceTime, but But in a time like this, I think reaching out to to people is what well, I think I'm frozen. Yeah, I think we're back on. Oh, am I am I back? Yeah. Am I back? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So so just connecting with people, um, I think is imperative. Um another another great thing to do in terms of kind of decreasing some of the the stress level is is knowing and understanding that everyone is doing the best that they can. Everyone is in this together. This, this isn't just uh, you and your baby and your family, it's the entire world. So like, um, uh, and so there are gonna be some people that, that maybe are a bit more on edge, a bit more irritable. And it's just bringing that sense of understanding that, that everyone kind of is under a lot of stress right now. Um, and, and it's having that compassion and kind of taking a deep breath and, and recognizing that that everyone really truly is trying to do their best in a, in a time that that is really scary for for a lot of people absolutely we were chatting offline you also mentioned to stay away from the news uh is yes. this something that you recommend because it adds a lot of stress but how do we stay informed yeah so we recommend um taking one website that that is a reputable website so uh, ontario public health is a great one uh canadian the canadian website for public health also a good one um and trying to stay to away from any of the social media um even the news articles there's so much out there it's so overwhelming and it just fear builds on fear and it just kind of keeps building and building and building. So limit limit the, the amount of time, maybe 20 minutes, just to kind of get the reliable updates of what's going on. But then shutting it off and, and doing something that will bring some joy into your life. Uh, reading, playing with the kids. Um, if, if your baby's in the NICU, watching, asking the nurse to set up iPads so that you can watch your baby, trying other ways to just kind of stay away from this, this, the news that's constantly everywhere. And it's the only thing that anyone is talking about. Yeah. So really trying to, to find other things to do and find other things to talk about. It's okay to watch a funny movie in a stressful time like this. It's okay to talk about, you know, uh, frivolous things because, that's sometimes what you need in, in really stressful times is to laugh and just kind of forget about what's going on around you a little bit. Absolutely. This is a great uh, tips and we're going to have them all available on our, uh, Carolyn is actually going to write a blog with all the tips that you're giving to us. I also want to uh, remind people that we do have our uh, peer support group online on Facebook, it's the Canadian Premi Parent Network is a network of over 2,500 parents across Canada that we share uh, our successes, our challenges, we ask questions, and it's a great group for parents to get engaged. We also have the online support group on Wednesdays with Kate, as I mentioned before, at one o'clock Eastern time. So Kasha, I also I wanna talk about a parent's mental health, because we all know Parents who experience an ICU are at a much higher risk of developing postpartum depression and PTSD. And I, obviously this is all new to us, but I believe this could be raising those numbers during this time. Uh, and parents often ask us when is an, what is an appropriate response, when they should be concerned and seek help of professionals. Yeah, so, um, uh, and I have, I have a check to Fabiana that um, and maybe Carolyn when you're doing the post you can post in there um, there it, it's a great checklist to really um, uh, decipher whether or not am I having a, a normal appropriate response to a really stressful time it is okay to be stressed out during this time it's okay to be uneasy it is it, it, no one knows what what the next day is going to bring so that's okay but where yeah where do you draw the line where is excessive emotional distress uh when it's becoming unhealthy so um a few a few things to kind of gauge um 
emotional mental signs, feeling sad or irritable most of the time. Um, you can't take any pleasure in most of the hobbies and activities that used to bring you a lot of pleasure. Constant worry and racing thoughts that can't be controlled. Th those are signs that mm, maybe, maybe I'm above and beyond what an appropriate response is to, to these challenging times. Some physical signs could be increased pain or tightness in your head, chest, stomach, or any of your muscles. Constant fatigue, really low energy, even though you've gotten tons of sleep the night before. A frequent nausea, vomiting, constipation, or diarrhea. Those are all a lot of physical signs that, that are indicating that I'm really anxious about this. And then some behavioral signs, sleeping too much or too little, trouble getting through your daily responsibilities, moving too slowly or you can't stop fidget fidgeting. Those are some physical or behavioral signs that, that are indicating, oh, maybe there's something above and beyond uh, happening here with me. So there, there is a, a long check, checklist and I can send that to Carolyn so um, people can kind of take a look at that and, and have a look at whether or not they're feeling like their response is an appropriate response or maybe it's going a bit above and beyond. That's great. Uh, Kasha, but if you identify there's some of those symptoms that you mentioned, what parents should do? Would they need a referral uh, to a specialist? To, how is the process now that it's, uh, you know, we know that many appointments are being doing online. Uh, what is the, the process at this point? Yeah, so there are some um, uh, self-care strategies online that I can also post that, that people can take a look at. Um, some of the other um, um, things that might be uh, helpful for people are using the mindfulness apps that uh, you can download onto your, onto your phone. Um, some of them are free as well. Most of them are free. Um, the Calm app, uh, Headspace, the mindfulness app, those are great ways to kind of bring down the anxiety. But if people are thinking, I really need something above and beyond this, I need some, some professional help and some professional support to get me through this, um, you can um, self-refer to Toronto Public Health. Healthy Babies, Healthy Children is still running. Again, it's all going to be virtual, um, but they're still doing um, uh, their consults. Um, some of the other perinatal mental health um, um, teams here, the one through Women's College, again, you can self-refer to, to those ones. Uh, all of it's going to be online consults, but, but none of them have stopped their services. They're just um, uh, redefining how they're delivering their services. That's Again, if you, have, yeah, if you have a connection with a social worker from previously when you're in the NICU, all of the social workers are still in the hospital. Um, feel free to give, to give that social worker a call and, and uh, because everyone is kind of in different uh, districts. Um, so specifically that's, that social worker would likely know the resources in your community best. Certainly, and all, I believe also the family doctors would be able to make it recommendations for families at this point, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So I also want to let people know that you did a, a great podcast for CPBF, episode 14. Uh, 14 people can actually uh, download this free on iTunes on, on our website, canadianpremies.org. Uh, Kasha talked about different stages of grief uh, different stages on their NICU journey through the NICU and beyond the NICU. Uh, she talks a lot of mental health, so it's a great podcast. We also have the season two of our podcast series on mindfulness. There's a lot of mindfulness exercises for different podcasts that parents can use uh, during this time. So Kasha, I want to ask you about the fathers because we always... Um, Kind of leave the fathers aside uh, when we're in the ICU, uh, and I know that is today are much more engaged than they ever been with their babies in the ICU, caring for their babies. And now you even mentioned earlier that some fathers are, cannot come because moms are breastfeeding. How are the dads coping? Do you have any insights to give to dads? 
Yeah, it's it's really unfortunate. I'm and I am really sad about the policy because we had reached a point where where finally some of that sexism had kind of decreased a little bit, where it was all the focus was always on mummy and and baby and and um. Uh, we were seeing more and more dads really taking initiative and being involved in their in their child's care, which was amazing to see. And and now, unfortunately, um, having this one parent policy in place, um, it typically is the moms that are that are coming in. Although s- some families too are trading off one day mom, one day dad. Um, it is harder, so that is why that uh, we are um, offering. Sorry, <laughs> everyone's calling right now. Uh, we are offering the e visits and the e rounds to have dads at least be able to virtually attend um, those meetings. Um, we also have the father's mental health um, uh, team, so they're still again doing all their consults with with dads. So. Um, that also is self-referral, or you can go through your social worker if you prefer as well. Um, so there's that resource as well. Um, but unfortunately, I'm, I am really sad because I do feel like this is impacting dads uh, more than moms because it is moms that are coming in. Okay, Kasha, thank you so much. I will ask Carolyn and Pam if they have any questions to you because I want to be respectful to your time because I know you have to go back to the unit. Anything for Kasha, Carolyn, and Pam? Any questions from, let me see if there's anything for our group. Uh, so Kasha, there's a question from our group actually. Uh, is there any guidelines that all Canadian ICUs are following that came from Canada Health or each hospital make its own decisions? For example, parents and siblings visits. Are you aware of that? Yeah, so there, there's no um, universal directive coming from um, um, any sort of governing body. It, it really is based solely on, on the hospital uh, policy and, and um, hospitals decision making, um, although it is coming from the upper level management. So uh, it's not our unit manager that's making these decisions, it's the CEOs, the v- vice pre- presidents th- that are making the visiting policies right now. Um, and again, it, it is to limit the amount of exposure that really truly is the, the underlining um, uh, motive in all of our visiting policies is how do we limit exposure to these babies, um, to the, the potential of the virus. So I do know that, so there are some NICUs that are a little bit more laxed, particularly um, the level two nurseries. Uh, again, they're working with, with uh, stronger, healthier babies. We're level three nursery. We are getting the sickest, the smallest babies. So we tend to be much more conservative and much more strict in our visiting policies. Right. Uh... Okay, is that true if our kids get COVID-19, we can't be with them in the hospital? This is another question that came from our group. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Our hospital here at Mount Sinai uh, is just uh, working with infants. I know that if one of our infants had uh, COVID-19, we wouldn't restrict the parents. So again, I think you would have to, it would depend on what hospital your, your child is at. Um, I, can't, I can't speak for any other hospital but our unit. And, and I know in our unit, we wouldn't, we wouldn't restrict uh, no parents. Right, and I think uh, all those uh, questions have to be addressed at particular hospitals. As you mentioned, they all might have different policies for visiting at this time. Yeah. It's Carolyn. I do have a question. Sure. Uh, Yeah. So seeing that you're in Toronto, I'm not sure if you're aware, but my question is, um, are the social work teams across Canada in the different hospitals able to, or are they providing a similar service and support to fathers as you are in Toronto? Unfortunately, I, 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 it, it's limited resources across. Uh, Toronto tends to to have more resources. Um, I only know of our fa- father's mental health team here. The only other one that I can think of that really goes into other communities is the the Pale Network. But again, that's more for loss. Um, and so I don't know of any just kind of mental health um, specific. Uh, 
organization that that's specific to father's mental health except for the one here in Toronto although um given now that they're doing online consults I I don't see why they would would reject someone that's living outside of the Toronto GTA area specifically if you're now doing uh, FaceTime yeah. I think it's worth actually contacting them and and putting a referral through Thank you, Kasha. Any final thoughts, any last uh, advice or tip for parents at home or in hospital right now? I, I think just kind of, you know, take your deep breath. We're all in this together. Um, we're all trying our best. And, and I guess know that um, this too shall pass. This, uh, this isn't going to be forever. It is temporary. We don't know when it'll end, but um, hopefully things will kind of get back to a new normal at least sometime in the near future. Okay, Kasha, thank you so much for joining us and taking the time away from the unit to connect with families online. We really appreciate it. We are extremely grateful to you and all the frontline workers that are working through this crisis. Thank you so much and I hope you can join us again in the near future. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Kasha. Bye now. So now we're going to continue our Facebook Live with parent experience. We have here Carolyn and Pam that I introduced you earlier uh, today. And Carolyn was in hospital with her twin boys for uh, three months in contact isolation. And Pam spent 112 days in the ICU with her son. And she had mentioned here that only her and her husband were allowed in the ICU at that time. Uh, and her daughter didn't get to see her brother until he was three and a half months old. So she spent a lot of time or, on her own in the unit. So thank you again for uh, being here with us. I see that Pam is at work. I see our office setting at the back and Caroline's working from home. So Caroline, I will start with you by asking, what did you learn about being in isolation with the twins? Um, so I'll rewind a little bit. Uh, my experience was actually almost 10 years ago when my twins were born uh, at 27 weeks. And um, unfortunately, due to their health and some ongoing complications, we found ourselves in contact isolation. Um, so in those really early days, what I found, of course, is that it's tough trying to figure out your new reality. Um, not only are you in a NICU, which has so many different policies to learn and this whole new language, we, all, we always say it's like a whole new language that you have to learn. Um, so that's challenging in itself. And then throw in contact isolation. Um, what, that, what that basically means is when you go in to see your child, not only are you washing your hands as you typically would when you arrive, you're, you know, washing your arms up to your elbows, um, getting ready to be able to go and handle your babies or feed your babies, whatever it is that you're doing at that point in time, but you're also having to put on uh, gowns and gloves on your hands and then moving in to see the baby. Um, given the fact that I had two babies uh, in contact isolation, I had to do that routine each time I went in and out of their individual um, isolation rooms. So that was extremely challenging in the very early days. Um, I would say it probably did take me about two weeks to get into a routine. Um, and as Kasha said many times in different ways, um, you, you have to be uh, forgiving, you have to forgive yourself, you have to understand that everyone is going through challenging time. Um, so that's what I really learned in the very early days was just to kind of go with the flow. Um, yes, you're going to have your moments where you're upset or you're, you need to walk away, you're frustrated, however, you know, whatever it is. Um, but eventually you'll figure out that day-to-day -day routine and what the expectation is and also um, what your own personal expectations of the situation are. Um, so yeah, it's just you need to give yourself patience in those early days. So what did you do to help you fill your time with your babies in isolation? Because I guess this is what most of parents in the NICU are doing at the moment as the groups have been canceled. They cannot have visitors coming to see them and the babies in the unit. So what did you do that you could actually recommend to other parents the strategy that worked for you that maybe it can work for somebody else? Yeah. Um, so I was in a very similar scenario at the time 10 years ago where it was only my husband and myself allowed into the NICU. Everyone else, we only were allowed the parents or the primary caregivers into the unit. So that meant no siblings, no grandparents, no aunts and uncles, any of those people. 
Um, so basically what I found over time, and this was 10 years ago, so things have changed social media wise quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I ended up doing was I started um, a very simple blog so I could update people. Um, I became very obsessed with my Facebook account so that, you know, I could post uh, photos. Um, I didn't do a lot of that when I was in the unit because as Kasha mentioned, we weren't often allowed to have our cell phones in because we were in contact isolation and there was just that risk of extra exposure to, you know, bacteria or illness. Um, so I did have my uh, phone sometimes in an actual bag, like a little baggie, like she showed, and I would take some pictures with my phone. Um, and sometimes I would bring my camera in so that I could upload and, and share information on Facebook. So that was just a nice way for me to feel socially connected to the people who I was so far away from because I was not in the same city as I actually live um, where we were for our NICU uh, experience. Um, I also read to the babies and um, there were you know, some favorites that I would read. I also read to myself just so I could sit there. I would actually not sit necessarily in their isolation room, but I would sit outside where I could still see them and read to myself just you know, a typical novel. Um, the news, whatever it was that I wanted to kind of just keep up to date and have some me time while also being nice and close to my babies. Um, what else did I do? Oh, scrapbooking. I'd go back to, I was staying at a temporary home um, and I had a lot of time on my hands. So <laughs> I did a lot of scrapbooking and just, you know, kind of catching up on some of those things that are more about myself and things that I enjoy doing. I wanted to make sure that I stayed connected to those kinds of things. Uh, because self-care is, as we know, very, very important. And it's also very easy to forget about when you're under that kind of stress. Absolutely. Yeah, I did ben, like that. Yeah. ben, do you want to share with us what you did when you're in the ICU? I know you're not in isolation, but you mentioned that you spend a lot of time by yourself. How did you cope with that? Yeah, I think um, a lot of the same strategies. Um, did some journaling with Sawyer. Um, and I, I spent a lot of time just kind of doing just little things, you know, whether it was like changing his blankets or, um, you know, just wiping him, keeping him clean, keeping the space really um, personal to us and just creating an atmosphere. We had a a private individual room, so we had the space to kind of make it our own, um, which was nice. But yeah, just doing kind of those mom things that I would um, be able to do or would have done at home that I couldn't necessarily do as easily in the NICU, but trying to make it as normal as possible. That is great. Well, I spent five months in NICU with my son. And for me, what really helped me was to uh, journal. So I wrote, uh, I wrote pages and pages every single day about what was happening that day with him, but also how I was feeling that day. It was really a good strategy for me to help me cope with those uh, 146 days that we spent in the NICU. But Pam, you also took a, a, a role of the mentor parent in the ICU, and certainly now uh, the, the, this in-person role is no longer happening. So how do you feel you can still support family during this time? What happened in your hospital there? Um, well, we do have a like one-to-one connection program for peer mentors to connect with families. Um, so just trying to get that a little bit more um, forthcoming with reaching out or getting staff to reach out to families and connect them with parents. And that can all be done online over a phone call or texting or whichever, just to let people know that we're still there um, for them and that they aren't alone. And then again, just um, really trying to let families know about the online networks. We have a specific group for our hospital as well that parents can join, um, these kinds of things. I think sometimes even I was just encouraging people like put it on in the background, even if you have other things to do and you might pick something up or you might be able to share. I think we all have really valuable experiences that can be shared. So even if you can't be here the whole time or you only have five minutes, it might be the five minutes that you needed that day. And really just encouraging families to stay in the moment. I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed when I think about what the future might hold. So just taking it moment by moment. I think one of the things that I recognized once I left the NIC was I pushed a lot of the emotions down. I didn't really feel like I needed to grieve because each day we were doing better. However, um, I still needed to process that. So letting parents know that it's okay if they're angry about the policy changes now. You don't have to live there, but you can still acknowledge that that's a real feeling for you. 
Absolutely. And I think for many of us, it's, uh, we have to process our emotions. And for me, particularly, I had to deal with my emotions when I actually came home from the NICU after five months that I have to grieve a twin that I lost and make sense of everything that happened in the NICU. But now I really want to talk a little bit about home now, because obviously a lot of families were home who were discharged from the NICU recently, or some of us have a little longer time that we all already had some time to process that. But for families who are newly, newly discharged or home uh, for five, six months, and we know the beginning is a very lonely and isolating time, and now we are kind of uh, obliged to be on isolation in our homes. And I, you mentioned, Pam, before in other talks that we had, uh, that we were very isolated in the beginning, caring for a child with complex care needs. How did we cope with that? And how can we share your experience with other families having the same uh, experience at the moment? Um, yeah, I think it set in a little bit more when we got home because I didn't have even the nurses just to talk to every day or other adults um adults around so i was really by myself and that took it, it was a big adjustment to move home um i think just the worry of being out in the community and i can't really even imagine what families are feeling right now with that um but i had to get really strong with what my boundaries were being willing to say no to people coming to visit um, they might not understand why and then really just trying to stay engaged um, with people that maybe I had met on the unit or reaching out. And I think one of the biggest things we learned was being able to ask for help and, you know, say what we needed. Um, if we can't even do something one day, that's okay. What kind of, what doable steps can you do? Keeping the routine, still continuing to journal. Um, and then also if you have a partner around, like, can they take, can you each take like 30 minutes a day or whatever timeline you might work and have uninterrupted time to yourself? I think that's a huge piece, whether you have a shower or you read a book or you take a nap, kind of just knowing that you have time to yourself as well. Absolutely. Carolyn, any advice from your side or you want to share your experience coming home with the twins? Um, yeah, we came home just uh, toward late August, so not quite moving into RSV season, but it wasn't far from our minds at that point. So, um, you know, we did have to set up some expectations or guidelines for, you know, family to understand this is why we can't have everyone, have everyone in the home. Um, as we moved in toward Christmas, we did have family in, but we, I was very you know, very specific that they had to be properly washing their hands, using hand sanitizer, and just respecting how far we've come and what what my and my husband's um, priorities were with respect to um, avoiding additional illness when we've already had already been through so much. Um, so there's that, and um, as Pam said, just making sure again that you're looking after yourselves. Um, often it's dad who's gone off back to work, and that can be you know, busy, very busy. They're on a schedule and when they get home, they're tired um, and recognizing that more often than not, it's mom who's home looking after a baby or two or more. Um, and that also is a full-time or triple-time job um, depending on what's going on and, and how healthy or maybe even unhealthy the children are. So I had a lot of appointments in those early days and that was my um, social time. Like Pam said, kind of going out and chatting with nurses and doctors so mm -hmm. um, just remembering that you can reach out to your support network even if it's through social media or FaceTime or any of those apps where you can actually have that you know face-to-face -face connection or even picking up the phone like we said earlier um, I think that's really important to um, keep your sanity and, and feel confident about being a parent of a premature or an ill or ill child yeah so because certainly now we are all in isolation so uh we probably not going to have people coming over to the house and say no to the people to come to our house or many people are working from home. So we don't have to have that as much worry at the moment because we are so afraid of our babies uh, getting sick again because they are so much more vulnerable. On last Friday, we did a Facebook Live with Mary and Brat on how can we protect our babies 
uh, from any respiratory uh, illnesses. And Marianne mentioned that she's, she feels better now that everyone is home with their babies and the siblings are not going to school or daycare. So the babies are actually more protected because they do have uh, not as a strong of immune system yet on the first year of their lives. But we do have that video saved because they're coming, some questions are coming to us uh, like more medical questions and some of those questions actually that video answered that I'm sure is on our Facebook page with Marian Bratch was done on last Friday and on Monday we do have Dr. Sharon Unger the neonatologist and the clinical director from the Human Milk Bank in Ontario and she can ask some more of those questions so you can send those questions to us but I really want to talk a little bit about um our experience as an ICU parents, I feel that somehow prepared us for this. Because in my experience, I spent one year isolated at home with Gabriel on oxygen, very vulnerable. Um, also, my social time was going to appointments with him and chatting with nurses and doctors and other ICU parents over the phone. Uh, so somehow I felt that I'm more equipped to deal with the situation. Um, but I want... But also there, there's some adds on because now I have a 10 year old at home. I have Gabriel who is now seven, my premature baby and my husband's working at home and I'm working at home, I'm not on mat leave. Uh, so I'm working at home trying to juggle kids and schoolwork. So I find this piece a little bit more challenging for me but I want you to tell us how that experience of the ICU prepared for you to cope with this experience now. Well, um, I joke that this is what we trained for. Um, <laughs> been there, done that. So uh, yeah, definitely. I, I, I probably feel a little more positive about this isolation. I'm not dwelling on the fact that I'm, uh, quote, stuck in the house. I'm okay with this. I understand that um, there is an illness and everyone is at risk of acquiring it. Um, so just taking those proper steps and proper hand hygiene, washing your hands effectively, um, I found that I've kind of had to train my kids. Yes, they understand about hand washing. Mm -hmm. um, however, this situation has escalated that need, I would say, um, in ensuring that they're really doing, you know, proper hand washing, as we know, kids can be in, in a rush more often than not. Um, so that's really prepared me for the realities of, you know, what these um, infections or illnesses, viruses and so forth um, can do to an individual. Um, I've seen it with my own eyes. So yeah, I'm definitely prepared and I'm more than happy to stay in my house until this is over with. Pam, you? Yeah, I'd say I think there's um, just this deeper understanding of uncertainty and almost comfort in everyone having to follow these isolation guidelines where you maybe don't have to really set up the boundaries because people understand. I think it has Per, like medical complex parents or NICU parents are really familiar with uncertainty and with the highs and the lows and taking it day by day. So, I mean, a lot of my friends that I've talked to in, in the medical community are just like, this is our life every day. You know, we've been through the isolation. We've, we've been through all of this. So not really much has changed for us. We've been forced to stay home, you know, like I didn't want to be a stay at home mom and that, is just where I had to be because that's what my son needed. And so um, I would say it's probably a little bit more comfortable for a community like this. It's still very isolating. However, there is that kind of deeper understanding. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. At least in my experience, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. And for me, I've been uh, really focusing on being present. I think that is the biggest NICU lesson that I learned uh, to be present in this moment because I realized back in the ICU that present moment is really all that you have. And then if you think about the future, then the fear kicks in. And when this pandemic really started to hit us hard, I was actually in Brazil on March break and uh, I was very, very, very afraid of flying back with Gabriel to Canada. I was so afraid of Gabriel getting sick because I know what sick looks like to him, right? A, a simple cold for Gabriel means readmission at sick kids for days, for weeks. Uh, so I was very, very afraid. So the strategy that I used was to be present and look at him so he's healthy now. And my second 
instinct was what can I do to my community? How can I help my community? Uh, and I think that is my biggest uh, coping strategy. What can I do for others that take my mind out of my own uh, way um, of feeling that fear that might never come? We are locked inside the house. So that's how I cope with that stressful situation, trying to juggle things at home. I'm working from my kitchen today. Um, so it's just learning how to adapt and be flexible with the changes that are ahead of us, in front of us, that we don't really know what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, uh, but really stay present and enjoy the moment and see what, do we, what can we celebrate today. Uh, for me, it was a, a big time to stop everything that I was doing and prioritize what's really important. And what is really important to me, first, obviously, is my family, my children. I get to spend time with them now, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, sit at the dinner table and talk to them, things that we were not doing before uh, so often. So that I see the gifts on that. I also feel so passionate about our community of parents. It's, uh, it's, it's this passion that um, really roles my life right now and help me to cope while I know we are helping others through the foundation. And I think if I stay focused on that, I can get through that. And I hope everyone is able to see a gift of what is, what is the gift of being isolated? How can we celebrate this moment that is so hard, as Kasha said, turn off the news and really be present with your children at home and your baby, we have so much to celebrate. The babies who made home, who are home now, uh, despite the challenge that we have, because we all have challenges, but what is there to celebrate? And I think that is the, something that we can start looking at to change uh, how we, we see the world at this time. Yeah, I think um, just to add on that too with the celebrations, like having a little gratitude practice each day, whether you write it down in your journal, and even maybe taking that step one step further, what I've started doing is like, what did I appreciate about myself during the day? And I think that can be huge as a mom is like, what did I do really well? And, and can I be honest with myself about that, right? It's easy to kind of get sucked into the fear and the worry and anxiety, but what did I do really well? Absolutely. Um, yeah, that because that deserves to be celebrated too. And even if it was, you know, I stayed present for five minutes, that that's okay. That's huge. Thank yeah. you, Caroline. Anything to add? Um, I said earlier that you need to um, have the ability to forg forgive yourself, like Panna saying, maybe you've had a rough day, but maybe something went really well. So recognizing and honoring that. Um, but also now that I have two 10 year olds and a 12 year old, also helping them um, realize what they've done well today and, and you know, thank them for that because they're, you know, working really hard to stay um, isolated or whatever word you want to use, um, sticking around the house as much as possible. And this is not their norm. So even recognizing and thanking them for that is really important right now. Uh, it's so important. It's a positive reinforcement that kids are doing well uh, because it's challenging for all of us. So exactly. I think that is great point. So I really want to thank you both for taking the time to chat with us today. Uh, and I want to remind everyone to stay connected with us through our social media channels. We are doing Facebook Lives on Mondays and Fridays, 1 p.m. PM Eastern time. Next Monday, we have Dr. Sharon Unger from Mount Sinai Hospital. She's a neonatologist and the, the clinical director for the Human Milk Bank in Ontario. Uh, she can ask, uh, answer a lot of questions regarding breastfeeding, pumping during this time, and also how we can still encourage moms who, can, who are able to donate uh, breast milk to hospitals because it's a critical time right now for that. Uh, next Friday, we're going to have Dr. Chantalon Smith. She's a, a psychologist and she can talk to us about how you're parenting uh, children at home during this time and any other question related to mental health. So we have a great lineup of speakers for the next couple of weeks. And then Wednesday, Kate Robson again is hosting the online uh, peer group in real time, also on uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time. So we also have the online peer support group that, that's ongoing is a Canadian Premier Parent Network on Facebook and a lot of families are there from across the country and we are all experience the same challenges and trying to celebrate the small uh, daily victories. 
So I want to thank you all for uh, being with us today and for joining us at this difficult time. And I want to give a big shout out to Renata, who is uh, a great uh, tech supporter and a great, she works behind the scenes for CPBF and she's always there to support our work uh, with all the tech stuff and the posts on our social media channels. Thank you, Renata, for doing that. We really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone. I hope you have a good uh, weekend, despite the fact that we are all like, locked inside the house. Uh, but we see you all on Monday. Thank you. And thank you, Pam and Carolyn. Thank Thanks, you. Bye. Thank you.